Okay, well, first of all, hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Tom for the invitation to speak here. So I want to talk about spectral gaps in quantum spin systems. That's sort of implicit here. So I want to first uh, talk a little bit about what are spectral gaps in this context. So define them and why they're relevant. Then the second thing is I want to explain what this word frustration means here and what, why we're interested in frustration-free models. That's the without frustration part, so frustration-free. Then I want to talk about the results. And they'll be finite size criteria. By that, I mean that one can check somehow what the spin system does on a finite number of spins, say 10, and then infer properties for infinitely many spins. And the last thing, maybe if we have time for that, I'll give a glimpse of the argument to the basic idea and how frustration freeness is very useful. Okay. And please interrupt me at any time if you have questions. OK. So I want to first talk about the model. So we consider a chain of m quantum spins. So it's a one-dimensional model. Yeah, some sites, and at every site we place a spin and they interact with their nearest neighbors. So the Hilbert space that this model is defined on, so I call that script H, is the tensor product over these m sites over some local Hilbert space. That's the space that a single spin lives in. That's CD, where D is bigger or equal to 2. OK, so this is the space of physical states of the system. Uh -huh, now I'm already running into trouble with how to organize. OK, I'll write down here. Uh, the system is defined by a Hamiltonian. And f to fix the Hamiltonian, we take any pair of spins and let them interact via a fixed matrix that acts on CD, tensor CD. So we fix a projection <coughs> P acts on CD, tends to CD. And now to define the Hamiltonian, I have to write down a model where at every bond between these spins, there sits such a P. So I have to embed P into the uh, set of operators on H. And I do that in the usual way by tensoring with the identity. So then the Hamiltonian, Hn, is given as the sum over the sites, Hm. These local interaction terms, where these local interaction terms are given by embedding this p into the algebra of the whole space. So this is formally what it looks like. So what I'm doing is, right, I have all these sites. And I want to act only with p here and trivially everywhere else. So act with the identity. And over here, there's some, you see I'm skipping two tensor copies of CD, tensor CD. And on the skipping of two, I put the P. OK? So this is all a very standard setup for quantum spin systems. But I think it's, you know, it's easiest to do it in a one-dimensional model and fixing a projection P. Uh, so uh, if this is unclear how I define this model right now, please, please ask. So the basic image to have in mind is I have some M, you should think of as, you know, at least 10 or something. I have some large Hilbert space. And on it, I put a matrix that's pretty sparse. Um, and it's defined sort of by taking, by taking just one fixed matrix and putting it at every one of these bonds. It's some big matrix, this HM. Yes? Why do you have to put projection? Uh, this is just, so what I, what I, the one thing I do want is that the Hamiltonian it's not negative, so I want to shift. And then um, projection is really just a matter of normalizing things. So what I basically do is I take some other interaction and just you know, take, uh, replace it by a projection on it, the orthogonal complement of its kernel. right? So I took it the spectral decomposition. I replace 
the zero eigenvalue, I don't do anything, but all the higher ones, I replace them by one. And this is a question of normalization that doesn't change anything for frustration-free systems. But of course, I haven't made that assumption yet. So it's really some kind of. I could use some other operators. Right. It doesn't have to be a projector. Right. It's just convenient. It's a matter of normalization. Thank you, Tom. Does the rank matter? The rank will matter for this frustration freeness assumption. That'll come later. But basically, you should think of the rank as not being too large. Right now, I haven't fixed the rank at all. OK? Uh, but in examples, right, I mean, for example, in this Heisenberg models, this is some projection on the symmetric or anti symmetric subspace. These are very different ranks, and I want to think of ones with low rank. Just in, keep that in mind for when I specify frustration freeness. Right now, nothing is, no rank is fixed. Yeah? But about the previous discussion, did I understand correctly that if H is another term? Yes. There is, I mean, sorry, if you prove it for the projection, you can conclude by simple deduction that the thing is true for more general. Exactly. Assuming frustration freeness. Assuming frustration freeness. That's what I was trying to say. Yes, right. So right now I'm just specifying these kinds of models, and later on I'll assume they're frustration-free. So sort of if you go back and would initially say, assume it's frustration-free, take some other ones, then one could deduce all the results up to uniform constants. Right. Good. So other questions? Right, so some big matrix. And what we're interested in is the spectrum of this matrix. The spectrum of this HM. And because these represent energies, I write this as E0 and E1 and so on. And note that here, uh, to find them with multiplicity. I want to have them strictly ordered so E0 might be degenerate. And in particular, we're interested in, because physics happens at low energies, uh, the spectral gap, which I'll call gamma m, which is E1 of m minus E0 of m. So because I've allowed for degeneracies in the definition of E0, this is always a strictly positive number for every fixed system size m. I'd have a big matrix. It's um, all of these p's are Hermitian, actually non-negative. So the whole matrix is Hermitian and non-negative as a spectrum. I plot it. And then this is the gap. Okay. So I want to explain the relevance of the gap in a second. But before I want to say there's a basic dichotomy. So because we're ultimately doing statistical mechanics, we're not interested in the case of some small m, but we're interested in the case of some large m. And while the gap is positive for every m, it's not clear what happens to it as m gets large. So it might close in that this thing might go to 0 or it might stay open, and that it's bounded below. And that's the basic dichotomy in this business. So case one is that there exists a uniform constant such that for all m, gamma m is bounded below by c. That we call the gapped case. It's really somehow uniformly gapped. And then the complementary case is that, I mean, strictly speaking, is the case that the lim inf is 0. Of course, usually, if the lim inf is 0, also the limit will be 0. That's the gap less case. OK? Given all these notions, that's sort of the kind of two categories we can put a system in. We have a Hamiltonian. We say it's gapped or it's gapless, depending on which one of these one or two it satisfies. That's because I've put E0 has multi may have multiplicity. Oh, oh, I see. So I take, even if I have seven eigenvalues oh, right. at the bottom, right. right? This is just by definition. 
<laughs> sure. OK, fine. Then, uh, fine. Uh, then I defend the gap to be infinity. Then it's, it's certainly gapped in that case, right? Um, OK, very good. Other questions? Good. So this is the basic dichotomy. I want to explain why this is uh, relevant. This is kind of the motivation part of the talk after I gave you the definition. So um, essentially, the, if you're gapped, you have some control. That's the basic message. So um, if H M is gapped, then the ground state which by definition is the eigenvector for E0, the eigenvector is well controlled. So in some sense, the gapped case is the good case. So for example, we have exponential decay of correlations. And uh, another form of exponential decay of correlations, which is somehow more suited for applications in modern quantum theory, is uh, an area law for the entanglement entropy of the ground state. So it's, it's fine if these are just words right now. I mean, I, these, I would say, are motivations for a physicist to study this problem. Um, the main message is that gap means well-controlled ground state. And ground state is the eigenvector for E0. Right? So, so it's the eigenvector for what happens here. And if the next point in the spectrum is kind of far away, you can control what happens to it. Okay. And then the other reason why physically one is interested in this distinction is uh, closing of the gap. So having gap, 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 then gapless and then gap, gap, gap again as one varies some parameter of the model indicates a phase transition. As you vary some. Right, as an underlying parameter, if I vary it and I see that the gap closes at one point, then probably I'm in two different phases on the left or the right of those intervals. So concerning the first OK, very good. Very good question. This is proved in all dimensions, the exponential decay of correlations. But the area law is only proved in 1D. Right, so the statement that having a gap implies an area law for the ground state is proved in one dimension. That's a famous result due to Hastings. And it's certainly conjectured to be true in higher dimensions. But it's a big open problem. Uh, other questions? So it's, like I said, it's fine if this is just a list of words that doesn't mean a lot to you right now. The main reason that I flashed this up is to say the spectral gap problem is relevant for physics. Okay. So uh, this is sort of the setup. And now we want to study which of these two cases of the dichotomy we are in for some of these models. Okay? Now, like I said, there will be this, the next part is this assumption of frustration freeness. And I want to motivate why we should make an assumption. So I'm going to move, maybe I put it here. In general, distinguishing gap versus gapless is a hard problem. as you might expect, because it has far-reaching consequences. So as examples of that, um, maybe I can fit it here. In, in 1D, this, uh, there is a, a long-standing conjecture that a certain natural class of models, namely integer spin Heisenberg antiferromagnets, for those who know, 
is gapped is a, is a famous conjecture and it's been open for a long time. And if it's already a famous difficult conjecture in 1D, how bad is it going to be in two dimensions? It's, in fact, undecidable in general. For, for right. So that's, there's a lot of questions one should ask about that word, I guess. So the first statement is it's even undecidable for translation invariant Hamiltonians. They, they were uh, certainly not frustration free, pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not frustration free. The, so the point is that there's no algorithm that decides, given a Hamiltonian, right, is it gapped or not. Um, so it's algorithmically undecidable in that sense. And the surprising thing is that you can do this in the translation invariant class. You can't sort of, sort of very far away always change something that the spectral gap suddenly changes. Right? And is that ever in both directions? In other words, uh, there are conditions which, if they are, a finite calculation can tell us that say, there, is, uh, there is a gap, perhaps, but no amount of finite calculation will tell us that there is no gap. I think it's really in both cases. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think so, yeah. This is proof? Yeah, this is a paper of Wolf, Kubit, Perez Garcia, I think. Anyway, so the, the statement here is that if one restricts a very general spin system, it's a very difficult problem. So we want to make a simplifying assumption But the simplifying assumption should still allow for physically relevant models. And it turns out that the right assumption, which is perhaps not obvious, is to assume this frustration freeness. So I'll first write down the assumption that I explain what, where it comes from. It's the assumption that you have an element in the kernel of all these projections. Which, if you think about it, is equivalent to saying that E0, the lowest energy, is 0. And I'm assuming this for all n. Right? So let's discuss this a little bit. So one way to think about this model is that because it's a non-negative, I know it has to be non-negative of all these h's. I think it is I have a chain, and I want to minimize energy. Every time I'm in the kernel of the projection, I'm happy, because I paid zero energy at the, with those two states. Every time I'm in the range of the projection, I pay energy one. I'm unhappy. I may even be frustrated, because I paid a price in the energy. So we have a set of local constraints being in the kernel of that projection that we want to all satisfy. If you satisfy all of them, we have energy zero. The problem is the difficulty, really, and that's also sort of the quantum part of the problem, is that these constraints don't commute. They overlap. Well, this assumption says even though they overlap, there is a way to make all the constraints happy, to be in the kernel of all of them at the same time. Therefore, you are not frustrated at any point. It doesn't say you always. It just says there is a state, one element at least, of the Hilbert space you can pick, such that you're in the kernel of all of them. OK. So we make this assumption from now on. Yeah, it means we know it kind of solves half the problem of the gap, right? There's two pieces of data, and you kind of, but it actually turns out to be much more useful. Um, yeah, so basically we assume, I mean, right, this, any element in that set is then the, the ground state. Um, we don't assume that we know what it is, right? Okay. But sort of more explicitly than that, this is the description. Right, so here's a, here's a theorem. This is guaranteed in 1D. This pertains to John's question about the rank earlier. If the rank of P is less than the maximum of D and D squared over 4. But I remind you that D is the dimension of the local Hilbert space, right? All my spins are in C, D.
So this is this projection, right? I mean, this is all sort of local data. It's all an assumption about this one projection I pick once in the beginning. And then I put it everywhere, and that's kind of some many body stuff. But here, this is just sort of picking the local interaction. And it's really just an assumption on the local interaction. Right, because one parameter is the rank of P, the other one is the dimension of the local Hilbert space. So it's a of yeah. Or yeah. It's I mean some condition. The way I mean it makes sense that you might think that the rank should be small, because you're unhappy if you're in the in the range, right? Yeah. That means you pay. Means you pay a price. If you're in the range of the projection, you pay energy one. So the smaller that range, it's the easier it is to avoid it. So that's that's why the that's all you need. So, uh, and, and in, is it that's only in one dimension? Can you, you can define the same thing in higher dimensions, or, or what? Yeah, I don't think it's known in higher dimensions what a good condition is. I don't know it. Yeah. But if you have a specific model, I mean, of course, it depends on the model, but all you have to do is to find a space. Right. Yeah, maybe as a general intuition, in Heisenberg, when you're ferromagnetic, yeah. you're unfrustrated. You, you can be unfrustrated if, if you're Heisenberg one half. Ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic. Because you kind of all want everybody to align. Yeah. But if you're anti-ferromagnetic, you can't make everybody anti-symmetric with everybody. Sort of a, even on three sides, you can't do it. Even frustrated. But anyway, I mean, you can also check them, right? You have, one, you have a projection on symmetric. Once you have a projection on anti-symmetric, you can check this rank condition. OK, so this is just some kind of general theorem that says this is not a totally crazy assumption. right? We can check it by just computing some numbers in some explicit example. And also, there are lots of examples where it's satisfied that are interesting. I just mentioned the Heisenberg spin 1 half. Then there's the AKLT model, of course. There's two-dimensional models, like the Tory code, which are frustration-free. So somehow, on some high level, it's a little bit more like a regularity assumption. Then some kind of it's not quite integrable, right? It's it's something. Uh, it's certainly very helpful, but it's not s so restricted that you're only uh, looking at integrable systems. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Does this condition make sense if p is allowed to vary? So now you pick just one projection. But yeah, I think it's actually the same condition. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. So now I will always make that assumption. Now I want to talk a bit about some results. And this is now this section about these finite size criteria. Okay, So we want to decide which of the two cases we're in based on what the system does at finite size. Note that the statements here are really about infinite m's, right? So maybe I'll wipe the board a bit. Because if I put it all here, it might be too far and too small for everybody. Let's go here. OK, so here are some finite size criteria. So for example, all the, all the higher spin ferromagnetic uh, spin chains are OK? Or? No, just spin 1 half. Just spin 1 half. Yep. Yeah, so it is restricted. Um, finite size criteria. So I first want to talk about some previous results. And for that, I'll need to introduce a periodic version of the model I wrote down earlier. You see, we were on a chain of M sites, but now I want to close the chain and be, make it be on a ring. <coughs> so how I do that is I take periodic version of the Hamiltonian, which is just the old one, and I add one more projector that adds the mth and the first site. And gamma m periodic is its gap. Defined the same way. And the previous results are all about the gap of this I mean, lower bound the gap of this. So here's the theorem. And this is uh, originally due to Knabe in this form. 
88, and then it was improved by David Gossip and my co-author, Genio Moskunov, in 2016. Um, so, right, so I said it's a finite size criterion for these arbitrary large systems. So there's two size parameters now. One is M, that's the big system, and one is N, that's the small subsystem. Think of M as huge and N as small. Okay, so there's an N that's small and there's an M that's huge. Then the gap of the periodic system is lower bounded. Oh, there exists a constant depending on n by the gap of the open system minus some explicit threshold. Okay? This is the statement. It's a lower bound of the gap of the periodic system. Oh, sorry, n. And what it involves is the gap of the open system, open means this, um, minus some number. Okay. I'll explain how we can use that to decide whether we're in this gapped or gapless phase. Oh, is there some? <laughs> yep, that's right. Thanks. N, uh, I can always get mixed up when you write this because I always think of n as being bigger than m, but you got to go on the other way. Yeah, I got to go on the other way just to confuse you. <laughs> right. So, um, so here's a corollary. Uh, suppose there exists some n zero such that gamma n zero is bigger than this threshold then, I mean, this, then this guy is gapped. Right? Because suppose it's for some n0, this is a positive number, and there's no, I can make m arbitrarily large, independent of n. That's important. That means I get a uniform lower bound on this guy. Right? It's, it's uniformly lower bound on any finite m, and for large m, it's uniformly lower bounded by this. So we should think of this as a threshold that we have to beat. As soon as we beat this threshold, this statement gives us a positive lower bound, and we fix n and make m large. Okay, so this, of course, is something in principle you could check with a computer. If n0 is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, just check it. If you're lucky, you beat it, you, you know that you're gapped for all n. So corollary 2, which follows immediately from this, is if hm is gapped, then HM periodic is gapped. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right, because if this guy is gapped, then eventually this will be smaller. Right, this, is a, this will be lower bounded by some fixed number, eventually this number is smaller. So in other words, if the system which has a boundary is gapped, then that system is gapped too, right? Sort of just as some intuition, the, the converse, now you might ask, well, maybe they're just always the same. I mean, I just make some tiny boundary change, right? Uh, this is a tiny perturbation in some sense. I mean, there's, there's m terms here, there's one term here. Of course, the perturbation is not small in norm. That's norm one, and the gap might be some one over m thing. So now you might say, well, maybe you're saying that <laughs> you make a study perturbation, it never matters. But uh, just to so say that, that this is, it's a bit more subtle, here's, for example, in 2D, there exists examples for which somehow uh, there is a gap in the, I mean, the reverse is not true. So HM is gapless. But HM periodic is gapped. And this is, of course, taken to be, I mean, with some grain of salt, because I didn't tell you how to define these things in 2D right now. But the basic idea is that if you have a boundary, you put something in your system, and there could be states that use the boundary 
to have really low energy and kill a gap that would be present in the periodic system. The periodic system is what the bulk of this look like, looks like. So this is just to say that this, this corollary cannot be reversed in general. In 2D, we definitely know it. Even if you still have a plus ratio of 3, right? Is yeah. this corollary true if you don't have plus ratio of 3? Might not be. Might not be. I don't think it will be true in general. I mean, we know very little about first non-frustration-free systems. OK, so this is just to show that this is somewhat of a subtle question. The boundary can matter for whether you're gapped or gapless. OK? In that case, well, I mean, in the two-dimensional case, uh, is, is, the, is the statement or is all the fact that you have a degenerate ground state and the boundary is splitting it? I think it's even true for infinite volume ground states. So no. Right. But it's not so hard to construct an example where you can see that you don't have a band structure with a gap. The periodic boundary can be constructed. I mean, there's something somehow implicit in all of this, which I really didn't want to discuss. It's somehow the point that I'm only looking at finite sized gaps, and that's different from infinite volume gaps. They're really different notions, but I really don't want to get into that. We can talk about that later. It, it, I mean, it's, it's a good point, but I prefer just think about finite systems. So, okay, so this well, result. This is all finite. Yeah, right? yeah, always finite, right. And gapped really means that you know, we have a uniform lower bound for all system sizes. Right. So, this is the old result, and it tells us something about the gap of the periodic system. It gives us the criterion for when this periodic system is gapped. You have to check finite systems. By the way, why is this the right order? Because if I have a system that's wrapped, think of this, I mean, it's on a circle, that this system, and I want to construct it out of small systems of size n, then these small systems will necessarily have to have open boundary conditions. I can't also wrap them on a torus. That's not what a subsystem of this looks like. OK, so now but I, we were interested because of, for some application, we wanted uh, to prove that a model, th this is lower bounded. And a result like this can't show a lower bound on gamma n. It can only show a lower bound on this periodic version. So we wanted a version of this where we can basically remove this periodic. And that's what the theorem is about. And this is with Jenya Moskunov. Uh, so it's a very similar setup. Oh, I, I always assume frustration free, by the way. There exists a constant such that, and now the point is that on the left hand side, I don't have this periodic. And now, unfortunately, one cannot exactly put gamma n, but one can put uh, the gaps of subsystems that are comparable to n. Uh, minus, and I guess then it's 4 root 6 over n to the 3 halves. OK. So this is overall, I mean, a similar looking bound. One thing you should notice is the power got worse. This is what there was a 1 over n squared. This is a 1 over n to the 3 halves. And of course, we have this minimum now. But the minimum shouldn't scare you because the n prime is of order n. If you change the constant 1 half, what changes? The 4. Uh, OK, so let's look at some other corollaries. Of course, we again have corollary, I guess, 1 prime that if there exists an n0 such that you know, this thing is positive, then gapped. Right? I mean, I just mean this is positive. Yeah, although that, though, was already in the, ah. in the previous result. Sorry, no, then hm is gapped. 
Whereas there, we only know that HM periodic is gapped. There's no way to infer from that kind of statement a lower bound on gamma n. Oh, I see. Right? Yeah, I was thinking corollary 2 went the other way around. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't. Right. Yeah. Right, right. No, I, I see now. Yeah. So this then also implies by corollary 2 that the periodic guy is gapped, once we know this. But somehow, yeah, this only ever functions on lower, as a lower bound on the gap of the periodic thing. This can function as a lower bound on the gap of the open. Um, and sort of now another corollary, I know corollary three, is that if, suppose now the converse. Let's look at the contrapositive. Suppose we know this is gapless. Suppose we know it goes to 0. Then this is saying it can't go to 0 too slowly. So if gamma m goes to 0, as m goes to infinity, so gapless, then gamma m must be order m to the minus 3 halves. So for example, it can't be that the gap of one of these frustration-free models goes to 0 like 1 over m. If it were to go to 0 like 1 over m, then eventually, because this is comparable to n, this would look like some constant over n, and it would be bigger than that for large n. And then we would get some fixed lower bound at that fixed n for all gaps afterwards. And then it can't go to 0 anymore. Okay. Right. So if I send the left-hand side to 0, then I know we really know that gamma n is big O of n to the minus 3 halves, but that's the same statement then. But only in some kind of average sense. It could be, you could have some very dispersed set of values of n for which it was true. I mean, if I put in the constant, what I'm really saying, I guess, is that we need to have a, this bound. That really has to hold everywhere, then. Because if it ever goes the other way, we're up to the minimum, I guess. OK, I would also have to put in the minimum. But, okay, but, but really, if it ever fails for any of the ends along the sequence, we have a gap. Right? So, I mean, I forgot the minimum here, but. Right. It's still probably confusing about the minimum, but. Yeah, OK, OK. So maybe I'll put the O back, because there's no minimum on the left. Right. OK. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the three halves, because it's actually easier to prove the result with 1 over n. And also in this statement, I would never told you what Knabe did, what Gosse Moskunov did. Knabe proved this with 1 over n. And they improved this to 1 over n squared. And it, Did you tell me that you kind of did something along these lines too, or no? Uh, yeah, so this getting their method to get this 1 over n squared, they say in their paper, was uh, motivated by a discussion that with Alexei Kutayev. Yeah who did this for tri tridiagonal matrices. I don't really want to discuss the method right now, because that'll get us you know, tangled up in the proof. But the point is that we worked somewhat to get the end of the three halves. And let me sort of motivate why, why three halves are being, be being better than one is relevant. So this will be, again, some kind of physics uh, discussion. But hopefully, I can convince you of three halves. Why is three halves relevant? And so one reason is that, I mean, it's KPZ, scaling behavior of the finite size spectral gaps. But that's somehow something I don't really want to talk about. In this context, the, the fact that three halves is bigger than one um, excludes uh, gapless edge modes, massless edge modes. In 2D frustration free systems. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to, right. 
The first statement is that uh, to get a version of this, thanks to frustration freeness and doing some coarse graining, a version of, of a, some exclusion result for massless edge modes in 2D systems, actually the 1D result is enough. But moreover, we also have a 2D version of that result. Okay. Oh. But some of the 1D result is enough. Okay, so to get this, and let me, yeah, right. Um, edge modes in 2D, first, whose gap, whose finite size gap would uh, scale like 1 over n? That's this one. Okay, let me, let me explain that. So the first statement is that if you have some massless edge modes in a two-dimensional frustration-free system or in any system, their gap should scale like 1 over n. And the second statement is because our result says, well, if it's 1 over n, it's gapless. But then it has to uh, go to 0 somehow sufficiently quickly. In particular, faster than 1 over n, you, you cannot have a 1 over n mode. Okay? So now let me explain a little bit why, why the gapless edge modes should have a 1 over n. Uh, finite size gap, so a gapless or massless mode. If I take a two-dimensional cylinder, a cylinder, and I have a, so this is some kind of heuristic for why it should be one over n. Uh, suppose I have one of the sides has length n, and uh, then I have a quasi-particle with a dispersion relation. E of k equals constant times k. <laughs> so it's some kind of linear excitation energy. Then you might look at this and think it's gapless because, I mean, of course, you have arbitrarily small excitations. But if you go on a finite size system, you, it, your quantum mechanics tells you that you have to discretize your momentum. It means discrete momentum. Right, because I'm looking at eigenfunctions of Laplacian, and uh, the eigenvalues behave like two pi over n z, pi over n z. So k is discretized. And so therefore, combining, so right, so I want to evaluate, so the lowest energy here is zero, and k is zero. And then I want to evaluate along this discrete grid so that it's smallest. The next thing I can do is put in something of order 1 over n. Because the dispersion relation is linear, I get a gap is equal to 2 pi, I guess it's pi, v over n, which is order 1, order 1 over n. Okay, This is just some rough heuristic. I mean, you might not be happy with this. I just wanted to give. Some rough heuristic that if you expect you have some excitation energies which in the continuum would be linear, which is what I mean by massless mode, then if you go on a finite size, we have discrete momentum, you should get a 1 over n spectral gap. So what do you mean by, by edge mode as opposed to you know, an ordinary eigenfluid? It should be local. I mean, these, these modes w would be localized. Right. Right. So this, this only depends somehow on this momentum in that direction, okay. right? Uh, and then our result says that in frust if you have frustration freeness in that two-dimensional system, that can't happen. Okay. You could have, you could have both. You, you could have. Yeah. You can clearly have uh, gapless modes, right? Not not edge modes. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. We're specifically including one way to say this just because 3 is bigger than 1. Yeah. We're excluding all finite size gaps that close like 1 over n. I'm just saying there is a family of finite Apple size gaps. Which are excluded by right, which are excluded by this. And this was certainly expected as some kind of folklore, I guess, that two dimensional frustration free models cannot produce these massless edge modes. And I guess it follows from. Because of because I said, I mean, one can do some coarse graining in the second dimension, even follows from the 1D result. I see. Okay. 
So, I mean, this was perhaps uh, a very heuristic, but the, the rigorous statement is you cannot have a gap closing like 1 over n. Okay. Other questions? So, yeah. you can use the 1D result to get the 2D conclusion, or you really need the 2D extension of your theorem? One, really, one can really use the 1D result, basically because the modes are localized at the edge, so I can sort of put all these sites into one meta spin. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, now uh, how much time do I have? The, the clock's correct? I don't know. No. What? Uh, uh, so let me ask you one other yeah. question. Yeah. Are you using translation invariance here at all or not? Uh, kind of. Um, implicitly, when I write down this, because I told you, or, or, or that other statement, because I told you we're constructing the system out of small subsystems. Yeah. And I'm using that they're all the same. They're by writing gamma n. They're actually identical or? They're, they're identical because they're just shifted copies I of each other, so they're unitarily equivalent. Well, I have even small variations in my. Then you would also have small variations of the kind of gaps you put here, yeah. which would make the statement much more complicated. In principle, the result could probably be proved. Okay. But you would have all these kind of whatever you know, local gap you have, you have, to have a it appears in the bound. Yeah. Right. But if you have a uniform bound so, with respect to the smallest gap or the biggest gap. Yeah, then it's fine. Right. Sometimes you have a, you can consider the two dimensional array in which uh, there are very different coupling uh, horizontally and vertically. For example, you use the, the rows to combine into a collapsing display, you get a one dimensional system. Uh huh. Uh huh. Does this technology apply to that? So the coupling horizontally are very different than vertical. <laughs> I think if you assume frustration freeness on top of that, it should be okay, and you have uniform bounds on the couplings. We would certainly use that because that's in this procedure I talked about in the beginning, where you replace the local interaction somehow by just the the projection onto the orthogonal complement of its range. Yeah. That you just use that you have upper and lower bounds and all the non-zero eigenvalues. Right, right, and if, yeah. Okay, so um, if there are no more questions, then I'm going to just flash up somehow the the key idea in the proof, which is really Knabe's. I mean, this is, uh, appeared in Knabe's paper, um, but I still think the idea sort of shows you how you use frustration freeness and how the subsystem comes in. So, so this is this glimpse of the proof. Maybe I put it here. So we want to prove a statement like this, that hm, and so gamma m, is bigger than just some constant, say. I rewrite that as saying that hm is bigger than that constant on the orthogonal complement of its kernel. It's exactly what it means, because on the kernel is the space of zero energy, and there are states in there. And so if I plug that in, I'm certainly going to get zero. So I can't have a lower bound there. As soon as I'm away from the kernel, I claim I'm in some other eigenspace and I have that gap. So this is certainly equivalent. But now the trick is that you put another H in on the whole Hilbert space. Okay. Let's look at these conditions. You see, what have I added? Well, on the kernel, I've added a condition on the kernel, but on the kernel, this condition is trivial. Both things give zero. On the orthogonal complement of the kernel, I can invert the operator. So I can cancel it again. So I have the old condition. So that's why it's equivalent. I really use frustration freeness here because I use that on the one end, somehow I can multiply by things in the kernel, and the kernel doesn't change anything. At the same time, the kernel is exactly the, the space that I have to be orthogonal to because it's the ground space. It's the E0, eigenvectors of E0. So this now is a much more, I mean, some kind of algebraic expression in the operator. We can work with that. We can compute h squared and try to bound it by h. The, up there is some very abstract state. 
Okay, so the frustration freeness buys you this already. Yeah, I used it, right. I know you used it, but I mean... Uh, yeah, I think that's so really the... Suppose you had that for some reason. <laughs> would, would, that, would that do the job? I think it's kind of the same as frustration okay. freeness, because otherwise I would have to take hm minus e0, okay. and then the same statement will be true with hm minus e0 squared. Okay. It's kind of the same. Uh, so let's, let's look a little deeper and see... Let, try to prove this. Um, so let me... For simplicity, let me do the periodic case. It's a little bit easier, as you can imagine, if things are periodic. So I want to compute h squared, right? Which is the sum of these j. And I call h j, j plus 1. I just call it h j. So I have these h j's squared. OK? Now what happens? Well, it's just some two huge sums, and I pair up every term. When I pair up h j with itself, it's a projection. It squares to itself. So that, I have a sum over j with hj squared. That's just hj. That gives me h. Then I have terms. I separate the other pairs into terms that are nearest neighbors, because those don't commute. And then I write the anti-commutator, which just means it's just a piece of notation. And for the other ones, I have Maybe i minus j bigger to, I mean, really on the torus, h i h j. I just computed the square. I've grouped the terms. Now, this is totally harmless. Because this, what well, looks maybe like the anti commutator is strange, these h i and h j commute. They are not on overlapping sites because they're distance two. They commute. It's a product of non-negative operators that commute, so the whole thing is non-negative. I remind you, we want to prove a lower bound on h squared. So that if this is non-negative, we can just drop it. I mean, we can't drop it in the totally in the completely general argument, but for the sake of this toy example, let's just drop it. All of them. We can. This term is great because we want to prove h squared big or equal constant times h, and the constant gives us the gap. So if we only had the h, and this term wasn't there, we'd be done. We'd have a gap 1. And that's not true, but for this term, we're very happy. We already have it in the bank, kind of. And, but this term is the dangerous one. Because it have, can have, the, these things don't commute. It's going to have negative eigenvalues. Let me call it q. And let's see what we do with q. And this is really somehow the, the idea of how the subsystems come in. So now we consider, this kind of falls from the sky now. But bear with me. Uh, we consider the following expression. I take h1 plus h2, this lives on three sites, square it. I take the next h2 plus h3, square it, and so on, until I wrap around. Well, why this? Well, I don't know any better reason. Let's see what it gives us. On the one hand, I can just compute the square. I get h1 squared, that's h1. h2 squared, that's h2, and I get the anti-commutator. Same here. Now I count how many times did h2 appear, once here, once there. That's it. And so overall, I get 2 times h, plus all the anti-commutators once, that's q. Now I found q in that. But how, I want a lower bound q, right? I have h squared greater or equal h plus q. On well, lower bound q. Well, that's now where the subsystem comes in. Now, what we say is that these are really the Hamiltonians of the subsystem. It's a subsystem on three sites. It's exactly what a Hamiltonian is. It's H3. Right? So what I do is I use this fact for H3. I have a square of a small Hamiltonian. So this thing is bounded below by the gap on the Hamiltonian of three sites h1 plus h2. That's how I got rid of the square. The square bought me the q. Now I get rid of it, and I have to put in this, the gap of the subsystem. The same here. So I use the fact that we reduce our claim to on the subsystem. Now if I put all that together, I've shown that this is bigger or equal gamma 3 2h.
right? Because all the H2 appears twice, H3 appears twice, and if I wrap around, H1 appears twice as well. So let's summarize what we have on this, just on this board. We have proved that H squared is bigger than H plus Q. That was the original statement dropping those terms that don't overlap. And the second statement we proved was that 2H plus Q is bigger or equal gamma 3, 2 gamma 3 times H. And now we can just do the algebra, and we see that we get a finite size criterion. Right? So this gives a lower bound on Q, which I guess is 2 gamma 3 minus 1H. Now use that lower bound up here, plug it in, and then I get that doing the algebra. I have a lower bound than h squared in terms of h. So now I feed that back into that series of equivalences, and we've proved that the periodic gap is bigger or equal to 2 times the gap of the open system minus a half. That's the 3. That was n equal to 3. Yeah, I mean, for higher ones, one can't drop these anymore. And actually, this Kitaev idea says one shouldn't use these. I mean, it gets more complicated. But the, the main idea is still go to this equivalence, try to check the equivalence on the whole system, and use it on the subsystem. And uh, yeah, and it just gets, you know, it just gets embellished. Sorry? Yeah, right. This, this gives you, this is exactly with the 1 over, 1 half is really 1 over n minus 1, which is order 1 over n. Right. Well, you gave us a glimpse. And that was, it was a glimpse, right. OK, are there any questions? Because I think I'm almost out of time. Yeah. Oh, well, I can tell you that after, but maybe just one comment is that in one dimension, it's clear what you mean by a subsystem. It's a subchain. In 2D, you have to worry about the shape of the subsystem. And it turns out that not all shapes are good. It's actually quite a delicate question. And so one thing is, I mean, what's the boundary condition of the whole system you're considering? The other one, what do you call a subsystem? And for us, it turns out that um, kind of rhomboids are the right shape. I mean, I'm not drawing it very well. And then n, I, I should say, this is important, n, what's n in the two-dimensional version, n becomes the linear size. And then one gets about with n to the minus 3 halves again. Yeah. OK. And the, yeah, these kind of rhomboids are some of the relevant kinds of subsystems for the way we prove 2D. Uh, we, I mean, we're not sure that these are the only ones. Um, that will work. So this, the 2D result basically says n to the 3 halves is robust. It holds for any frustration-free model on any 2D lattice with any finite range interactions. Of course, we can't compute it to constant then anymore, but just you know, a bound like this holds. Uh, where the minimum is taken over rhomboids like this with n prime, very good. maybe they also have to have some kind of eccentricity. But again, the eccentricity should be bounded relative to n. And this, yeah, that's sort of unavoidable. And this minimum, maybe, we can also say this, this comes from the fact that previously, when you had subsystems, they're always of size n. But now, when I intersect the subsystem with the big system, I might cut off some part of it. And that, again, one has to, in 2D, one has to intersect the patches with the 2D shape, and then one gets subsets of it. But if you take a 2D shape that's a diamond itself, and you intersect a diamond with a diamond, it's just a sub-diamond with eccentricity. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. Right. But so that's just, I guess, just a few words about 2D, but I'm happy to tell you more later. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this would work in 3D. Maybe one could define a 3D version of these. It's, I mean, it gets more and more cumbersome. Yeah, so this, right, you can just check, right, this corollary one was always uh, check a finite system. 
if the gap is bigger than some number, then you get a uniform gap. Right? So one can check this. I mean, actually, Knabe in his paper checks that the finite size gap is big enough on some n equal 4 to get that the gap, to get a, lower, a numerical lower bound on the gap of the AKLT model. It's a bad numerical lower bound. And just the computation is already computed in Knabe's paper. We can just, because it's always the same numbers on the right side, we can just plug them in. And then you get, he gets a uniform lower bound on the gap of the AKLT model with periodic boundary conditions, and we get it for open boundary conditions. So is it the case that if you were able to perform larger finite size calculations, you could get better and better estimates for the uniform gap? Probably, yeah, because this thing decays, and this thing should be bounded below by the, by the bound. But of course, it gets difficult, right, quickly. Very quickly. And for 2D, which I guess, don't know if the AKLT model in 2D is gapped. I mean, I think we know exponential decay of correlations, but not if it's gapped. It's also very difficult to put these on a computer because in 2D, I mean, because you have to, the linear size in 2D is the, the, and I mean, of course, the number of sites grows very quickly with the linear size. Yeah. So just a little bit of this, uh, as we discussed before, the Simon gave us a lead type inequality to the field possible. Yeah. Where you check in, in finite volume, and if you have, if, if you got enough decay, right? You, you, then you get it. In, in, uh, in, in, so you, get, you have to be ferromagnetic, and you have to have, you have to have certain things going. But it, it is in that same spirit. I mean, I would say, yeah. More generally, it's this kind of finite size criteria, which exists in lots of contexts, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Elliot, yeah. No, right. No, I think Knob is just an alternative way to do the squaring stuff. I mean, it's very similar. It's very similar. Yeah. Yeah. I know good people who still do not understand the AKLT code, so I ask. Oh. Who, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would expect it to be, yeah. Yeah, the monotone decreasing. Is that the case that you can prove that? Yeah, I expect it to be, I mean, but. Expect it to be. Yeah, it is the case that when for, for, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, I mean, because it's minimum, you really have to verify throughout a whole uh, power of two range. Uh, right. Right. It's not much harder than that to verify the last one because then the, then the, then the size of the matrices go down exponentially fast, right? Yeah. I mean, corollary three, <coughs> as written, isn't, isn't correct, right? Yeah, no, right. So what I should say, um, suppose, right, suppose, that, let's do the converse version. Suppose the gap behaves like n to the minus three halves plus, plus epsilon. <coughs> then it must be gap. That's, 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 I think, the version that you put, give yourself an epsilon, and then the minimum doesn't matter. Yeah, OK. I, I agree. This, I, yeah. I didn't think this through when I was writing it. But if, as soon as you give yourself an epsilon, the minimum is gone. Right. OK, well, it's like, uh, OK. I